Hello, welcome back. Today we're going to continue with the business side of the Woodcrafter by looking at the Woodcrafter business plan. But first of all, here's the jingle. Last time in the Woodcrafter business series, we looked at building a business plan using a technique known as lean business planning. In this episode, we're going to look at the Woodcrafter business plan. So if you're interested in seeing a works example, this could be for you. You should recognize from part one in the series, these five areas, vision, strategy, tactics, milestones, and forecast. If you've not seen that video or need a refresh, go and watch it now and then come back to this one. If you're ready, let's continue. The Woodcrafter vision is really simple. The Woodcrafter is a woodworking community that designs and builds heirloom quality products for our customers that will be enjoyed for generations to come. What that really means is I'm building up a community of like-minded makers and creating some standardized products that I want to take to a number of markets. And it's the community, plus myself of course, that will build these products and then the Woodcrafter will handle the logistics of selling and shipping and so on and so forth. So it's a community approach to building heirloom quality products. The strategy underpinning the vision covers these three areas. Remember from the previous video, we spoke about identity, market and offerings. So the Woodcrafter identity is about creating quality products that are accessible to people. By accessible, I mean a quality product at an affordable price. I want to provide scale through a community of like-minded makers who want to turn a hobby into a business. So the core identity of the Woodcrafter is quality and community. There's three markets that I'm looking to address. The craft market, where we create large volume, low cost products. The additions markets, where we create a design that we can build many, many times, but the customer has an allowable customization, types of material, finishes, etc., And they're made to order. And the final market is the original market. And that's where we focus on bespoke designs for form and function that meets a customer's specific need. The offerings break down into three key areas. No surprise, craft offerings, additions offerings, and original offerings. The craft offerings have four categories, kitchen crafts, luxury crafts, office crafts, and traditional toys. The additions market will probably focus on occasional furniture, office furniture, and garden furniture. And the originals, by its very nature, are bespoke builds. There's a lot of work to do in building up any business, and that's where the tactics really come to life. To simplify the journey, I categorize these in eight areas. The creative space, the offerings, the virtual space, the physical space, the community, the influence, non-core, and then the expansion. I'm not going to talk about expansion in this video series because that is some uniqueness I want to bring to the Woodcrafter down the line and I'm not quite ready to share that yet with a public audience. The other areas I want to look at in a bit more detail. The creative space is my workshop. That's the place I'm going to build the things that I take to the market. But I want to build the space in such a way that somebody watching the video could go ahead and create their own creative space. So I want to spend time looking at the design of the workflow. How does the workshop actually work? Then look at building the workshop to give us organization and structure in the products that we're going to develop and spend time looking at the tools and reviewing the types of tools I want to use. And the idea of that is that anybody can come along and build a creative space. We've already touched on the offerings, but in our tactics, I've got to take us much deeper than the strategy allowed. We need to research the offerings in more detail. When we start to talk about kitchen offerings, what do we mean? Well, in my mind, I'm talking about cutting boards. I'm talking about bread boards. I'm talking about knife blocks. I'm talking about utensils. And there's a market already well established for those types of products. So what are people creating in that market? How much are they charging? What's the lead time around that one? So we have to research the offerings in a bit more detail so we can start to understand the time, cost, quality components for each offering. How long does it take to build? What quality are we going to build to? And how much are we going to charge? And that's got to give us competitiveness in the marketplace. Once we understand that for each offering, we need to start to think about our suppliers. Where am I going to get the raw products from? What products am I going to use? What's the logistics? How do I get it from my workshop to the customer? What about returns? How do I manage all that? 
Having understood all that, we can then start to look at building the offerings themselves. What's the concept? How do we design it? How do we build it? Once we know how to build it, how do we optimize it? And then how do we produce that model? And then how do we scale that model up for the marketplace that we're focusing on? The virtual space is all the online presence. At its core, that's going to be the Woodcrafter website. On the Woodcrafter website, there will be an online store. How do we build that? How does that come together? How does that work? And then we need to think about our channels to market. Etsy stores, Amazon stores, eBay stores, etc. The physical space starts to look, well, exactly that. Physical bricks and mortar shops. And there's a lot of craft fairs around. There's a lot of craft outlets around. There's a lot of stores selling these type of products. How do we break into that market? I want to identify some local resellers that I'd like to work with. I'd like them to carry the Woodcrafter product range as we start to build out in this craft space and beyond the craft space as well. So we've got a lot of work to do in identifying and attracting and working with local resellers. A big part of the Woodcrafter strategy is the community. So how do I actually attract a community and how do we build up a community? Well, a lot of it's around the content that we offer, the YouTube videos. And if you remember, our videos focus not just on the business aspects of the Woodcrafter, but the workshop build, the product design, the product build, the commissions that we take on and so on and so forth. And that's all about building up and attracting a community of like-minded makers. Beyond the YouTube, the website becomes the core for the community. This is where we can come together and start to share experiences and communicate. So the website needs to develop beyond a traditional static website into a fully interactive website that the community can use. I want to push things further out there. So I want to start to look at Instagram and Twitter and how does that work and what do I do with that? And all that is about building a community that can come together into what I'm terming the maker's market. This is so we can get scale into the production behind the Woodcrafter. Many of you out there are already producing things and you don't have a market to sell them to because it's a hobby. How do I help you to turn from your hobby into a business that can start to sell as part of the Woodcrafter community? That's what I'm really trying to focus on inside that work. Building the community and maintaining the community takes a lot of hard work. And when you're running a business, work equals time and time definitely equals money. And I don't want the community to be an unreasonable overhead on the business. So the community has to be self-funding. And that's where this concept of the influence comes in. I want to use the community to attract advertisers and sponsorship. And all that's for is to generate a revenue stream that funds the community. So the YouTube maintenance and site, the website, the Instagram is all funded via a combination of advertising and sponsorship. As we start to attract advertisers and sponsors, no doubt people in the community will start to purchase from those advertisers and those sponsors. And the affiliates program allows us to get some return on the money that we're spending with the people who supply our products to us, be it those tools, be it the raw materials that we use. So the affiliation program, once again, is another revenue stream that comes into the influence space. And don't forget, we're not looking to make money from the influence space. We're looking for the influence space to fund the community so that can stay alive we can invest in it we can grow it we can give the community the things that it needs youtube presence website and so on and so forth the non-core tactics are all those things that we just need to have as part of any business we need to understand how we're going to do our bookkeeping how we're going to do our accountancy the legalities of the system how we manage tax and how we manage the overall marketing so there's a whole host of things that we know we have to do just to make sure that the business can sustain and it can grow and we keep control of all those various things that are important that gives us a loose idea of the tactics. Now, don't forget, one of the key tenets of the lean business plan approach is that we don't have to have it all right on day one. And we can revisit the tactics, we can take some out, we can add some to this, and that's all part of the process of building the business plan. And that's why we review this on a regular basis. Monthly is what we're going to go for. So having the tactics in place allows us now to say, what do I want to do and when? And that's where the milestones come in. So I've taken our eight areas, actually the seven on this chart here, because I'm not yet revealing the expansion plans. And I then say to myself, over a time period, and I've taken just over 12 months, 
what do I want to do and when and what I'm trying to create here really is a rolling plan so I'm making this video in January 2019 so you can see I've included November and December which is when we started the business and now I've got a 12 month horizon of activity as I get to February I'll add the following January onto that and that allows me to keep the plan alive and it allows me to continually to rejig the plan and it's this milestone approach that is really going to be the heart of helping us to drive the business forward. So I know that in November I wanted to set up the business. I know I wanted to create a website and I knew nothing about websites. And I know I wanted to launch YouTube and I knew nothing about YouTube. I wanted to build a workshop, which I did know about, so I could crack on and build the workshop. And you could see my workshop build takes me out through to uh, end of next month, end of February. So in December, I then pulled the business plan together, the one we're reviewing today. I also started to build my website because I had enough knowledge to be dangerous at that point. And I started market research. Which markets am I going to go after? Um, what am I going to take to the markets, etc. And I started to create a schedule of videos for YouTube because one thing about YouTube is you've got to plan ahead. Otherwise, the thing fails. And I continue to build my workshop out. January, I start to focus on my accounts because we're approaching uh, year end, uh, end of tax year in United Kingdom is end of March. So I need to get my account structured, how I'm going to manage that, the funding, the finances and so on and so forth. I've also now launched the website, um, first version of that, that will continue to develop month by month by month by month. And I'm now beginning to identify the key suppliers I want to use to help me to build the products that I worked out in the market research. And the workshop build continues. February, I now want to turn my attention to logistics. As I build products, because I now know what I'm going to build, how do I get them from my workshop to the customers? And if they have problems and issues, how do I get them back from the customers to the workshop for repair, etc.? So I now need to look at logistics. Don't know much about logistics at the moment, but that's okay because I know I need to go and find out. And I also want to work on the pricing strategy. I've got a pretty clear view of how I want to do that, and I'll be making a video about pricing at some point so we can share that experience. And my workshop bill continues and completes in February of this year. So March gets exciting because that's the month that we're actually going to start to launch the business to the marketplace. So I want to start to focus on marketing. How do I attract my customers? Where do my customers hang out? What messages do I give to my customers? But I also want to start to look at some of the legalities of the business because obviously once you're providing something to somebody or selling something to somebody, then you need to sort of kind of wrap that up in contractual terms. So I need to understand what do I need to do in the legal space. Again, I know nothing about legal at this moment in time, but I now know that I need to go and find out. And you can see in the offering family, I want to go to the market, quite a soft launch with two key products, likely to be some sort of jewelry box, likely to be a range of cutting boards. But I want to launch two products in the marketplace. And you can see the workshop is now productive and we're starting to build out those key products. So April, my marketing strategy continues and I also turn my attention to tax and how do I complete tax returns of new business. Again, I don't know, but I've got an accountant on board and the accountant, I'm sure, will help me through that and we can get that submitted. From an influence point of view, we continue to make content that we're going to put out across a whole variety of social media channels. And obviously, we're looking there to educate people, to inspire them, to turn their passion into a business so they can start to build things so ultimately they can start to sell them. And we kick that campaign off in April as well to really push that forward. Um, in the virtual space on the website, I'm looking to open the craft store and we can start to put those products forward. And in parallel to that, I want to now launch on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook to get further reach of that community. Product build continues, but have a month into the product at this point. So I want to introduce product optimization. And what I mean by that is I want to look at how I'm building the products and how can I optimize them so I can maintain the quality, reduce the time and therefore lower the cost if that's appropriate. May is really a month of rest. We're still building in the workshop. We're still optimizing our products. We're still creating our YouTube content and we're still pushing the marketing, but nothing big going on in May. 
June is where I now want to open some additional online stores, e-stores. And I'm thinking about Etsy, Facebook stores and Amazon stores to do that. And I also want to think about introducing two more products to increase the product range. And that's in parallel to all the other consistent things that we're doing in the background. July is interesting because I now want to start to think about the physical space and the the various stores that I want to try and attract. Again, I don't know much about that world, but I now know in July I've got to go away and find out and identify some target stores that I'd like to go and work with as partners to take Woodcraft products to the marketplace. So July is about understanding and evaluating that and August is then about targeting some of those stores and no grand ambitions. If I can get two stores um, to host or to stock Woodcrafter products by September then I'm happy with that and I'm doing it and I'm doing well. Also in September, you can see I want to open the affiliate store. By this point, we should have enough capacity inside the community where there's demand to start to buy the things that we're reviewing or, or the raw products or the things that we're trying to make. So launching an affiliate store at that point makes sense. And again, I want to introduce two new products to the range. What I also hope, looking at the community, is that YouTube threshold has been reached. Now, that was initially in the first plan due to happen in sort of November, but the YouTube channel is growing so quickly now, I think I'm going to be there way ahead of September. So that's the threshold where we can now start to drive in the influence space, advertising and sponsorship revenue. October and November, I'm going to slow down. We will be having a lot of production, I anticipate, in the workshop as we ramp up to the holiday season, uh, especially if we've got those physical stores online as well. But I want to take some time to not do anything significant to the business, to pause, to take stock. I want to educate myself, evaluate what's going on and assess uh, the plans and the changes for the future and then November becomes a very important month because that's where I want to start to give the community the opportunity to start to bring their products into the markets that we've now established throughout the year and that's part of how do I get capacity in the production side because obviously if I continue to build everything in my workshop we're going to bottom out pretty quickly so the community then really comes into its own during that November December timescale as we launch and bring on board the makers market. That takes me to December where we'll be launching the next final, the next calendar year business plan. But remember we're evaluating the plan every single month and this becomes a rolling plan and that gives me the flexibility to change as the market dictates. Oh that's great, so how and when do we start to make some money so this is a simple forecast view now what i've not put on here today are the figures and that's because i simply don't know yet and to be honest with you i don't really care at this point i think there's enough potential inside the plan where instinctively it feels like a sensible thing to do and because i'm not looking for investment i don't really need to worry too much about the returns and my overall horizon is three years before i get to a sustainable business but what I did want to understand is when do I think I'm going to start to see some revenue returns and what are those revenue channels so you can see that the community I uh, kick off in Q1 2019 and at that point it's more of a cost than a revenue stream and I don't really expect that to be giving me any returns until quarter four of 2019 and then I think I'm going to get the returns from advertising from the sponsorship and from the affiliation and don't forget those three areas are just about making the community sustainable that's not about making lots and lots and lots of money for the business the makers market is where the community really starts to give a strong revenue return and I'm not expecting to see any of that until quarter one 2020 the craft is where we're going to get the short-term returns and in quarter two of 2019 I expect to start to see revenues flowing in from the online stores and from quarter three 2019 I expect to start to see revenues flowing in from the physical stores and those revenue streams obviously continue through um, subsequent quarters the additions market can only really happen once we start to get some capacity in our production. So it's imperative that the makers market is launched, becomes robust, scalable and successful. So I'm not expecting to see any revenue or even activity in the additions markets until at least quarter one 
2020 and the originals market is way out there in 2021. So what I'm trying to do with the forecast at this moment in time is to work out where the revenue comes from and when the revenue kicks in. Now, word of caution, if you are going to your bank manager to get a loan to kickstart the business or you're going to an investor, we'd need to do much more work on the forecast. And we'd need to start to put some returns on this um, on, on this chart so as we start to build things up on the left hand side community craft etc we need to understand the investment that we need that's the loan or the investment we're asking somebody to give us on the right hand side we need to start to look at when and how much we think we're going to get the returns and we can do that by market analysis and if anybody's really interested in that drop me some comments and we can have a look at um, our business and see if we can put some projections on side there but for me because I'm self-funding self-investing I don't really care too much about that so there you have it the wood grafter business plan we looked at the vision the strategy the tactics the milestone and the forecast and you can see that that milestone plan is really the thing I'm going to focus on as I develop the business over the next few months and, and years and I'll continue to use that approach so I hope that's been useful to you bit of a lengthy video this one before we go I just want to explain a little bit about the brand the name the wood grafter comes from two words wood the raw materials that we use and grafter which is really a fusion of multiple parts think about putting grafts on tree for example and it's also slang for one who works hard or one who works in markets so wood grafter is about creating things from multiple parts of wood etc the logo the little green tree well that's actually based on the tree of life that was created by Hannah Cahoon in 1884 and was adopted by the shaker community now the shakers actually use that symbol to represent fruit bearing trees that they reference back to the unspoiled loveliness of the garden of Eden now I'm not going down those religious connotations but what I like about the shaker community is this concept of building a quality no nonsense product via a community approach and they're the two aspects of the shaker work that i think reflect incredibly well to the wood grafter brand quality and community so i'm using an interpretation of the tree of life as the logo for the company and the heirloom quality products well that's just what we do so hope you found that useful that's the wood grafter that's our business plan and that's what we're doing to build the business Leave a like, uh, don't forget to subscribe, hit that notification and more importantly leave a comment. What do you think about the plan? Have you got any ideas? Do you want to get involved? Do you want to contribute? Certainly on that community side of things as we start to build up that like-minded maker type concept. End of the last video I mentioned a tool. Think about that plan, that plan on a page that we had that showed all the initiatives and things we're going to do over the next 12 months. The tool I'm going to use to manage that journey, to allow me to manage my time, understand what I'm going to do. That tool is called Trello, T-R-E-L-L-O. We'll look at that in a future video. Thanks for watching. See you next time.